next next uh, fall semester. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Rudy Gleason today. Uh, Rudy got his bachelor's and his master's from the uh, master's from the University of Florida. Uh, got his PhD at Texas A&M in 2004. Uh, he's currently an assistant professor, not an associate professor, which is said in the email that went out. Uh, that just totally jinxed you, Rudy. Sorry. Um, but he is uh, going up for tenure this year, and uh, he's doing great. So he actually actually has a split appointment: two thirds in ME and one third in DME. And today he's going to tell us about biomechanics and remodeling of arteries. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> Thanks for the invitation to be here today. It's really a pleasure to uh, to be able to talk about what we're doing among friends. Um, we. It's well known now that, that tissues grow and remodel in response to mechanical loading. And here's a, here's a good example. This is a longitudinal section of a rat aorta under normal, slide on the left is under normal uh, pressure, and, and the two slides on the right are under uh, experimentally induced hypertension. And we see clearly that in response to, to hypertension, increased blood pressure, these vessels grow and remodel in response to this mechanical loading. And it turns out that these adaptations correlate well with the stresses and the strains in the tissue. So the wall shear stress, uh, Kamai and Tagwa showed that the wall shear stress is the predominant factor in, in controlling the adaptive response to, to altered blood flow or altered shear stress. And here the, the adaptive response was the, the alteration in the, the luminal radius. Circumferential stress controls the wall thickness, here shown as H. Um, and, and so it mediates the wall thickness to restore nearly homeostatic values of, of, of circumferential or hoop stress. And also axial stress and circumferential strain have recently been implicated as, as key targets for growth and remodeling. So it, so it appears that remodeling occurs in response to, to multi-axial loading. And I'll put this slide up and, and I know there's some students in my tissue mechanics class, hopefully they won't run for the door when they see these figures. Um, but this is a, this is a this biomechanics tells us something about the, the local stresses in the tissue when we perform a stress analysis on, on a blood vessel. And so here's the classic configurations that we consider. This is the loaded, pressurized, axial extended blood vessel in vivo. We excise this vessel, we know it retracts 50, maybe even 100%, uh, reduces its, its radius to an unloaded configuration. And when we impose a single radial cut in this unloaded configuration, these vessels spring open, relieving residual stress. And this, this residual stress was recognized in sort of the mid-80s. Um, and it turns out when we include this residual stress, we predict under physiologic loading, this is under a pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury, uh, the blue line, or, I'm sorry, the, the orange line is the, is the circumferential stress. And it, it appears to be nearly uniform across the wall. This is the, the, the position in the wall. This is the inner radius and this is the outer radius. When we perform the same analysis, but, but, but we don't include this residual stress, in other words, we say that that the unloaded configuration is our, our, our reference, our stress-free configuration, we predict a much different result. We predict that the circumferential stress is very high on the inner wall and, and decreases monotonically as you go outside of the wall. So I just wanted to highlight, um, this is a, a, a nonlinear, modeling material is a nonlinear material, large deformations, very, very rigorous analysis, but when we don't include uh, an appropriate, when we don't reference our stress to an appropriate stress-free configuration, we get very, very different results. And so out of this somewhat complicated boundary value problem, we have residual stress, material nonlinearity. Here I've included a basal smooth muscle tone, uh, material anisotropy, large deformations. We predict this result that we just showed, that the stress across the wall under normal pressures is nearly uniform. But when we increase the pressure, say for example 200 and 240 millimeters of mercury, the stress across the wall indeed increases, but it increases differently at different locations with the greater degree of increase in stress at the, at the inner compared to the outer wall. I'm trying to figure out my, my three different controls here. Um, and so, so coming back to this slide from Matsumono Hayashi, we see that the vessel indeed thickened in response to increased pressure but it thickened differently, with the greatest degree of thickening coming at the inner wall locations, which correspond well to the, the greatest degree of increase in stress. <coughs> so it appears that, that remodeling is a local phenomenon. Stress is sensing and responding to their local mechanical environment and adapting locally. <coughs> the, the goal of our talk is to, is to we're going to talk about vascular 
uh, biomechanics and, and tissue growth remodeling with, with uh, some specific examples. First, we're going to consider coronary bypass grafts and look at some new observations that, 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 that we've observed in, in uh, coronary artery biomechanics and also the biomechanics of, of uh, a couple different tissue engineer approaches <coughs> for, for blood vessels. And then after that, we're going to talk about some, some work that we did in computational modeling for vascular remodeling and, and uh, present some of our ex vivo organ culture work in, in, in a mouse model and also in tissue engineered arteries. One of the nice things about, about being here and in, in speaking in IBB uh, is to, to, to talk about things that we're, that we're planning in the future as a means to, to facilitate collaborations and, and see if there's any, uh, any common interests. And so hopefully we'll have uh, plenty of time to talk about some of the new things that we're doing in our lab as well. Okay, so, so coronary artery bypass grafts. So here's a, here's a heart, and here's uh, coronary arteries. And, and this, this is just to illustrate a, a couple different approaches. One is a vein graft, where a vein is, is stitched into the aorta and into, into the coronary artery bypassing a blockage. Or internal mammary artery, which is um, an existing artery that, that is relocated to, to supply blood to the heart. Half a million uh, bypass grafts a year in the U.S. Uh, but currently the sex success rates are 60 to, to 85 percent. And in addition to that, many patients lack adequate grafting tissue. And so there's a there's really a pressing need for for a, a engineered vascular graft with with low thrombogenicity and immune response, appropriate mechanical properties, and, and of interest here, uh, the capacity to remodel to mechanical loading in their environment. So this is, this is a, a, a representative mechanical behavior of a coronary artery. This was taken from the paper of Holzapfel in 2007 for a left anterior descending human coronary artery. And this is a pressure diameter curve and this is the, the axial force that's experienced as the vessel's held at fixed length and inflated. Just to highlight a couple things, the compliance that is the, the change in diameter divided by the, the mean diameter over physiologic pressures. The compliance for this vessel is 4.6 to the inverse megapascals. And reported values for human coronary arteries ranges between 1.5 and 5 inverse megapascals. So we're going to use this uh, later as, as sort of a, a, a model or a target when we talk about tissue engineering. This is a, a little bit more uh, description of the analysis performed. Earlier we showed, we, we go from a, a, a single radial cut in our reference configuration that springs open. Turns out if we split the artery into the media and the adventitia, each of these two layers often have uh, different stress-free reference configurations. And so now if we perform a two-layer uh, biomechanical analysis on this blood vessel, we start from these independent reference configurations for the media and the adventitia and map these to the current loaded configuration. When we perform this analysis for this coronary artery using the same model, this is the, the distribution of Cauchy stress versus position in the wall. Here this is normalized to the, to the zero being the inner radius. And we see again that the circumferential stress in the media, it's nearly uniform across the wall. In this coronary artery, it's a little bit lower than the previous uh, example. The axial stress, too, is, is nearly uniform. In the and in the adventitia, it's slightly lower, but also, again, fairly uniform. So um, we're, we're performing mechanical analysis on, on coronary arteries in, in our lab and also on carotid arteries. Uh, this is an example from, from a pig. And we want to talk a little bit more about this idea of, of the stress-free or the, the, the reference state that we want to that we want to, that, that is required to perform our stress analysis. So here's a, a simple um, schematic of, of what we just talked about. We excise a ring, we impose a radial cut and it springs open. But it turns out if we excise a, an axial strip from the same vessel, these axial strips also bend. And this is an example of an axial strip from a coronary, pig coronary artery, or I'm sorry, pig carotid artery that we excise, and these things have significant axial longitudinal residual stress. And here's a, a collection of, of a number of strips from, from a uh, pig carotid artery. So we, we, we talked earlier about the importance of, of identifying an appropriate stress-free configuration. And if we 
follow the traditional approach with this or, or even splitting this into two layers, following the approach of holes awful, we see that we're, we're missing this longitudinal residual stress. And so maybe there's a, a more appropriate way to, to account for this, residual, this longitudinal residual stress. So uh, Roy Wang in our lab, al along with me and, and Alexander Rach have also contributed on this work, uh, had an objective to, to experimentally investigate this longitudinal residual stress and incorporate this into kinematics and stress analysis uh, uh, of, of uh, coronary and carotid arteries from pigs. We weren't the first to observe this, but there's only really two papers that we found in the literature that have even mentioned uh, this longitudinal residual stress. And one way back from the 90s and another more recently. Okay, so here, here's the, the study that we performed. This is a left anterior descending coronary artery where we um, performed several sections down the length of the artery. So here we, we for, uh, cut thin sections and then longer sections, thin and longer. And then these longer sections we, we cut into longitudinal strips. And here again is, is the results that I showed earlier. This for the coronary arteries, this for the carotid arteries. These are longitudinal strips. It turns out that, that as we go along, this is for the left anterior descending, as we go along the length from the, from the initial bifurcation down the vessel wall, the, the degree of longitudinal residual stress varies. Uh, this is also for the, the LAD. This is the, the, the circumferential opening angle, the traditional ring, versus the longitudinal opening angle. And we can see there's almost appears to be a trade-off as the, as the circumferential opening angle goes down, the longitudinal opening angle uh, increases. And so here, these are strips from, from closer regions to the, to the, to the bifurcation and, and regions farther away. And you can see that these strips remain almost straight until we hit this critical point and then they start to, start to induce residual stress again. So here's the, the, the kinematics going from, from the stress-free configuration to the, to the loaded, conf uh, to the traction-free configuration. And in traditional kinematics, we have a, this is the radial st stretch, this is the circumferential stretch, and this is the axial stretch. And following the approach of Chang and Fung, uh, the circumferential and radial stresses are a functional position in the wall, but the axial stretch was assumed constant across the wall. And so in our, in our, our results show clearly, though, that the axial stretch cannot, cannot be a constant across the wall. And so we introduced a, a new um, uh, kinematic approach to, to, address, to incorporate this radial uh, dependency of the axial stretch. <coughs> I don't really want to go too deeply into the, into, the, into the mathematics other than to say that now our, our stretches are a function of both this traditional circumferential opening angle as well as um, our uh, longitudinal opening angle. And the consequences of incorporating this into our stress analysis are shown here. This is the traditional approach of, of Chang and Fung, and this is the, the stretch ratio in the, in the traction free, this unloaded configuration. And this is the, the classic result shown by Chang and Fung where the, the radial stress decreases, the circumferential stress increases from below one to above one. That is compression on the inner wall, tension on the outer wall. And when we incorporate this longitudinal stress, uh, these longitudinal strains, we, we get both longitudinal and circumferential stresses increasing in the, in the stress free, cons uh, in the traction free configuration. The consequence of this to, to what we're really interested in, we're really interested in the stress in the, in the vessel wall under physiologic loading. And this was the, the, the result that we showed earlier, the approach that we showed earlier. Uh, the circumferential stress nearly uniform, maybe 130 to, to 60, so there's a little bit of a gradient across the wall when we, when we don't include longitude and residual stress. When we include this, the circumferential stress actually is nearly uniform. There's a little, little dip in the middle, but, but within uh, maybe 10 to 15 kPa. And so this predicts that, that incorporation of this longitude and residual stress predicts an even more uniform circumferential stress in the wall. But as a, as a, as a, as a consequence of, of the, the radial 
uh, gradients and strain in the axial direction, we get a high gradient in axial stress. So, so the consequences of, 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 of this are to, are to, or maybe the implications of this are that the circumferential stress appears to be something that, that the vessel is, is trying to restore to almost near, nearly uniform values. And so smooth muscle cells living on the inner regions of the wall are nearly the same circumferential stress as those living in outer regions of the wall. But they seem to be less concerned at growing and remodeling and adapting to restore their axial stresses. In coronary arteries, one of our sort of our current pursuits now is is there we've we've observed even a more complicated uh, stress free or track stress free configuration. So this is a long longitudinal strip of a coronary artery, and we see that not only do they do they bend um, in the longitudinal direction, but they also have these shear components in them. And so you can kind of see this from some of our some of our strips that they're they're shearing. And so we're, we're currently investigating some of, the, some of the, the implications of incorporating these shears into our stress analyses. Okay, so let me, let me, let me shift gears. We talked a little bit now about coronary artery biomechanics and, and, and why that's important. Now let's talk about uh, tissue engineered blood vessels and, and maybe using uh, our, what we've learned from coronary artery biomechanics as sort of a a gold standard or a, or a target to, 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 to reach uh, in terms of biomechanical properties of a tissue engineered vessel. So let's think of if, we're, if we could design the, the, the perfect engineered vessel, what would it look like and what are maybe some of our design criteria? Certainly we'd have to have adequate burst pressure and suture strength and earlier we talked about low thrombogenicity, uh, uh, low immune response and things like that. Um, we'd like to, to match the inner diameter of the host and the graft um, at physiologic pressures and axial stretches. We like to match compliance. We talked about the compliance of the vessel and we talked about cyclic strain being an important uh, mediator of growth remodeling. So we like to match the compliance of the vessel. And also the axial force imposed on the graft. As we implant this graft, the surgeon may stretch it some and we would like to, to match the axial force imposed on the graft under, under physiologic loading. And finally, the circumferential and axial wall stretches, which we'll talk about a little bit, a little bit more as we go on. Okay, so, so in, our, in our lab, we're, we're working on three different uh, engineer vessel approaches. The first is, is collagen gels. This is an uh, image taken from a paper from Bob Neerham's group, where the, the top is a collagen gel, this is a collagen fibrin mix, and this is a fibrin gel. And it turns out that we can make uh, vessels and tubular constructs and in fact when we mechanically stimulate them they adapt, they grow and remodel. So Bob Neerham's group showed that cyclic circumferential strain increases cell and extracellular matrix production, ECM organization and things. We performed some mechanical tests on, on freshly formed gels, two-day gels and this is our, our experimental protocol where we increase and decrease the pressure first from 0 to 10 for, for for four cyc five cycles, then zero to 20 for five cycles, then zero to 30 for five cycles, then zero to 40, and so forth, until the vessel ruptured. And this is a, this is a, a, a picture of our, our experimental results. So we inflated the vessel to, to 10, then we deflated it, and we inflated it again, and so each subsequent curve is a, is a, is a subsequent loading curve. So we see that these things there's a, there's a tremendous amount of, of plastic deformation until ultimately this vessel failed at around 40 millimeters of mercury. So these things, we load them and load them and they plastically deform, plastically deform, plastically deform until they, until they rupture. This is the axial force during that same test and we see that the axial force initially upon pressurization increases but it decreases and decreases and decreases until again it ruptures. Uh, we'll come back to this model in a minute. A another approach we're, we're working on in our lab is, is a collaboration with Yadong Wang, who's, who was at Georgia Tech and now is at University of Pittsburgh, with uh, scaffold drive tissue engineered blood vessels. Again, so, so the scaffolds are seeded with smooth muscle cells and lined with endothelial cells. Again, scaffold derived vessels have also been shown to respond to mechanical loading against cyclic strain, increases cell and extracellular matrix production. A third approach that we're working on 
uh, is a collaboration with Francois Auger's group in, in Quebec. This is called the self-assembly approach, and this is where cells are cultured on a, on a tissue culture dish for long periods of time and uh, in, in supplemented media, and eventually these cells begin to load da lay down uh, extracellular matrix and form thin tissue sheets. These tissue sheets can be pulled up and rolled around a mandrel um, to form a tissue engineered blood vessel. And so here's an example of these blood vessels. We've, we've in this collaboration, uh, Francois Auger's group has sent us um, what they call tissue engineered vascular adventitia, tissue engineered vascular media, and a two layer tissue engineered vascular media adventitia equivalent. And we perform mechanical testing and also are currently culturing these vessels uh, in, our, in our lab. This is, this is, these are representative curves of pressure versus diameter for the media, for the adventitia, and for the, and for the two layer vessel. And this is the axial force again versus pressure, this, this set of curves. And this dotted line is a curve for our coronary artery that, from, from the Holzoffel's group, our, our model coronary artery. So we can see that these vessels are, look, are, are pretty close. They're pretty close to a representative coronary artery, right? Um, here the, here the, the diameter is a little bit off, but we can, we can control the diameter by controlling the size of the mandrel that we wrap these sheets around. Um, if we look at the compliance over the, over, the, um, over the physiologic range, let's say 120 over 80 or maybe a little bit higher, um, the compliance of, of, of these vessels are about 2.2 mega, inverse megapascals. A little bit lower than this representative coronary artery, but actually within the range that's reported for human vessels, right? So these vessels look pretty good. Unlike the, the collagen gels that we showed earlier, when we load and unload these vessels, we get repeated cycles even over superphysiologic pressures. And so these don't creep, they don't relax like we saw the, the collagen gels do. This is the axial force during those loads. And this is a typical response that we see even from native arteries, that there's a little bit of a relaxation in the axial force. So these look pretty good, right? Um, we're able, we, we perform stress analyses on these to identify constitutive models. Uh, uh, we perform parameter estimation. This is an example for the tissue engineered vascular adventitia where the black open circles are the experimental data and the blue pluses are model predictions. So we can get very good fits. And in, in fact, this is a prediction from parameters identified from the media and the adventitia when we combine those models and predict what the, the, the two-layer vessel would look like, the blue pluses are, are the model predictions, the black open circles, again, are the, are the experimental data. So, so we have in hand now a, a predictive constitutive model for, for these individual layers, these two different materials that we can use. So let me ask you this question. What will happen when these vessels are exposed to mechanical loading? What do you think will happen? Okay, what, what do you think? Maybe I'm getting ready to teach class, so, so what do you guys think? Anybody have any idea? So the mechanical properties are pretty close, right? So, so, so this thing should go in and, and the patient should survive and this will behave even better than a, a venous uh, graft or maybe even better than an internal mammary artery, right? Or wrong? Who says yes? <laughs> Who says no? Why? Why do you think? Well, let's look at this again. One thing that we, that we haven't talked about, the compliance is pretty close, right? The diameter we can get pretty close. We can get the geometry pretty close, but what about the stress? So this is the stress in a coronary artery that we showed earlier in the two layers. Here, 80 kPa for the circumferential stress, maybe a little bit lower in the adventitia. The scales are different here. This is the stress in the, in the media. Here the stress is really, really high compared to the, compared to the coronary artery in the, in under, this is under 100 mill, millimeters mercury pressure. So what, what's going to happen? This is going to, if, if, we, if we believe that tissues respond to circumferential stress or tissues respond to stress in general, this is going to see this high stress and it's going to grow and remodel. It's going to get thicker, maybe. The media may get thicker. Um, it may respond axially, maybe this is high as well, so it may, may th that may be a trigger to induce remodeling. And so what happens when a vessel thickens? It gets thickened, it thickens, it gets more compliant, or it gets less compliant, right? It gets stiffer. 
And so even though we start out with a vessel that has the right compliance, has the right geometry, if it doesn't have the right mechanical properties or it doesn't have the right stresses in vivo, it can induce maladaptive remodeling. And this can cause a diverging path for this thing to become stiffer and stiffer, compliance mismatch, and then the vessel fails or occludes or, or something. Rick yes. Increase stretch it in the axial direction or the, would they before implanting it? This, is, this analysis is done at a stretch of, of 10%. Um, I don't know if there's any surgeons in the room, so, so maybe I can freely answer that. <laughs> I, I, there's a little bit of tension in there, but, but not a ton, I, I, I think, when these things are implanted. I think they're, they're pretty much almost, almost at a stretch of 1 or maybe 5%, something like that. And so there's no elastin in these? Are there any endothelial cells on here? Um, there's a little bit of elastin in, in these vessels, not a lot. Um, these don't, the, the mechanical test, we didn't have endothelial cells. That's right. But, but remember, these were, these were formed from a sh sheet on a dish and rolled around a mandrel and, and cultured to mature statically for a week. So they weren't exposed to any mechanical loading. Um, so. so let me jump back to our, our design criteria. We said burst pressure and suture retention. So, so these things are, are very strong. Burst pressure is on the order of 1,000 millimeters of mercury. Uh, we can match the inner diameter pretty easily by controlling how we, how we roll these things. Um, we've got the compliance down, in fact. Uh, in fact, we've got the axial force down if we Im implant these things at a, at a stretch of, of, of 10%. But we're missing the mark on the local circumferential and axial wall stresses. Uh, something we're working on right now, now is, is, is are there ways to, to fabricate these things a little bit differently? Can we change the geometry, say the, radi the ratio of the, the medial thickness to the adventitial thickness, or the ratio of the total thickness to the, to the inner radius, or um, some others, the, 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 the medial pre-strain? Can we, can we introduce a pre-strain in the media, or a pre-strain in the adventitia for that matter? Um, this is just one example of a, of a parametric study. Now that we have this predictive model, we can perform these parametric studies. This is just varying the thickness. 1H is the original thickness, or the, the thickness of the vessels we use now. If we double the thickness, what happens? If we cut the thickness in half, or in a quarter, what happens? And so these are just curves that we predict what the pressure diameter would look like, what the axial force would look like, what the circumferential stress would look like, and so forth. Uh, the blue line, again, is our representative coronary artery. So this is actually a little bit of a counterintuitive result. We, we cut the, the, the thickness by a quarter, right? When we reduce thickness of a vessel, we expect it to be more compliant, right? It, in fact, it is more compliant. It distends from, say, 4.4 all the way up to, to maybe 5.4. So the overall distension of the vessel is a lot more than for the very thick vessels. But over the physiologic range, the compliance here is actually higher than the compliance a little bit higher than the compliance of the, uh, of the, of the original 1H vessel. So these, vessel, th these parametric studies allow us to perform analyses that we can perform experiments on a computer instead of fabricating many, many vessels to see what the mechanical response is. Okay, so, so let me step back now. Everything we've talked about so far was just biomechanics of the, of the vessel. We didn't talk about remodeling yet. So what happens when a, when a tissue remodels, and in this case, a blood vessel? So we've talked about things like geometry and constitutive equation. That is the model that describes how the tissue responds to, to applied loads. We can use this, and this is what we've done, equilibrium and applied loads to calculate the local stresses, and we talked a lot about this. Now what happens? The cells living in these tissues sense and respond to their mechanical environment, and so they they do things like uh, produce MMPs and produce collagen, uh, produce uh, vasoactive molecules, produce um, uh, other things. <clears throat> and, and so these things, uh, these mechanobiological responses then induce changes in the microstructure, for example, the key structural proteins. And so we can predict evolution equations just to describe how the geometry and how this constitutive equation will change in response to these biological mediated mechanisms. And then from there, the cycle continues. So I don't want to spend a, a ton of time talking about our, our models other than to say that 
really there's, there's really two main classes of approaches in, in modeling this process called growth remodeling. The first is the volumetric growth models, which, which really model uh, growth remodeling at sort of the tissue level and how, um, how configurations, how our stress-free configurations evolve with time. And the second class is, is what I collectively call microstructurally motivated models, where growth remodeling is, is described by changes at the microstructural level. Here are things like collagen, elastin, muscle cells, uh, other key structural proteins. How do, how do these things change? And then with that information, can we predict how, how things change at the tissue level? So this is the approach we've mainly taken in our lab, although we have worked in, in both areas. And, and maybe just quickly we'll go through this. We, we model, one of, one of our frameworks that we use most often is a constrained mixture theory, which is to say that, that at, any, at any local point in a tissue, um, the, the, the individual constituents such as elastin, collagen, and smooth muscle deform as the tissue deforms. They're constrained to deform as the tissue deforms. But these constituents can possess their own stress-free or natural configurations, these, these key configurations when we're performing stress analysis that we need to identify what is the stress-free configuration before we can map this to, to calculate the stress. And indeed, individual constituents here, for example, collagen, different fib collagen fibers can have different stress-free configurations. And so, collectively, these uh, deformations, the strains in the different fibers can be different. And so to, to quantify this, and, and, and our, our general modeling approach is, is to assume that, that, that material is laid down or remodeled to uh, certain preferred or homeostatic uh, states of strain. And so here, for example, if this is our tissue at time zero and remodeling proceeds, some fibers may be degraded and new fibers may be laid down, here shown in orange, at different or the same uh, pre-strain, depending on things like what configuration it is. Um, and we have some kinetics that maybe we won't go into. Um, and here's just an example of, of uh, a blood vessel responding to altered blood flow. And so in response to a change in blood flow, let's say an increase in blood flow, the endothelial cells on the lumen sense uh, this increased shear stress, and they release things like uh, nit uh, nitric oxide to, to induce vasodilation. They downregulate things like endothelin, which, which reduces constriction. And so in response to all that, the vessel... In response to all that, the vessel vasodilates. In this case, we're considering a large change in flow. And so in response to, to, to this large change in flow, the, the maximal dilation, typically 10 or 15% for, for large ves vessels, uh, the maximal dilation is insufficient to restore the shear stress to, to target values. And so here, the, the, the uh, the red line is the inner radius. It dilates maybe here it's about 8 or 9 percent. And then as growth remodeling proceeds, as original constituents are degraded and new constituents are laid down with these new stress-free configurations, the vessel is able to dilate further and further and further until ultimately it reaches the, uh, the, the target uh, radius that restores wall shear stress. Over here is just a plot of the circumferential stress versus time, different, different lines are, are time and they're plotted versus position in the wall. So initially the stress is, is nearly uniform but, but not exactly uniform. Upon vasodilation the stress increases to the black line and then continues to increase as we travel up this curve but ultimately the, the stress is nearly restored to its, to its original value. Okay, so, so this is sort of a modeling framework that I just sort of gave a, a little bit of a flavor of. We haven't gone really deeply into it. But how do we test this kind of a model? We've got a couple um, uh, different experimental frameworks uh, uh, going on in our lab. One is, one is a mouse model, an ex vivo mouse model that we're using. And, and we've, we've built the uh, experimental device, and this is a really complicated figure as I stand here and look at it. Um, a mouse carotid is right here, and it's about 500 microns in diameter, and maybe about five millimeters long. And um, this device is designed to carefully control the, the flow through the vessel, the transmural pressure, and also the axial load or axial extension placed on the vessel. Um, we can also perform intermittent biaxial biomechanical tests. There's a force transducer here, and our flow system controls the, the pressure. These 
uh, motors are computer controlled so that we can control the length. And here's just an example of, of one of our uh, mechanical tests. Again, th these are similar to what we've shown earlier, just in a little bit different way. This is the outer diameter, this is the axial length. So these three curves are pressure diameter curves at three different axial lengths or axial stretches. These three curves are fixed pressure load length tests. So we're stretching and unstretching the vessel and, and measuring the axial force. And the blue, the blue dots again are how, how well our constitutive model, our, our model fits these data. The black circles are experimental data. So we said this is, this is able to, to carefully mimic the, the in vivo uh, mechanical loading and then perturb from that. So that the top curve here, this is a, a measured flow rate in a mouse carotid artery from an anesthetized mouse. And so the blood flow varies from about 0.6 is sort of the basal forward flow and then at each beat of the heart it goes up to almost two uh, uh, milliliters per minute. Is the, is the thing there, I can't really read that. This is our experimental device and what our device can do. So this is, um, this is, well this example we have a lot of control over both the basal as well as the peak flow rates. But we can see that we can carefully control the flow rate and mimic the in vivo uh, conditions. We also have the device now can, can introduce sort of uh, pathophysiologic flow rates, things like oscillatory shear stress. Um, and we can do that in, in our device up to hertz of, uh, up to frequencies of 10 hertz, which is the, the heart rate of the mouse. The device also is designed to fit on our, our multi-photon microscope on the first floor here, and we can perform uh, 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 microscopy on the vessel, even under loading conditions, and so we can have it under no load conditions, we can inflate it, and look how fibers deform as we inflate this thing. So this is an image of collagen in a mouse carotid artery. You can see the collagen fibers using second harmonic. So it's the, the device is also de designed to be to be sterile, and we can we can uh, culture vessels, and and we can keep these vessels alive and, and functional on the order of a week. And so this is a this is a typical functional test. Here's the vessel diameter this is normalized to one, and we we dose it with a, a vasoconstrictor that will cause the vessel to reduce maybe 25 or 30 percent. Of this is acetylcholine, which is an endothelial dependent vasodilator. And so we get this temporal response that it vasodilates and then reconstricts. And then sodium nitroprusside, which is an endothelial independent vasodilator. And so these vessels, this is at four days, this, this curve. But these vessels respond to, to pharmacological uh, uh, vasoreactive compounds after long, well, immediate, intermediate times in culture. So now, so, so sort of how do we quantify this? We have, a, we have a theoretical framework and now we have sort of an experimental framework where we have tissue level responses that are, that are mediated, depends who you ask where to start on this figure, but molecular level changes, so this is a, we can do things like mouse knockout models, which we have a couple knockout models uh, going in our labs. Um, of course we can do standard analysis like PCR and microarrays and westerns and all these things. Um, the motivation though for, for designing this device for a mouse obviously is knockout and transgenic uh, mouse models. We can collect information at sort of the microstructural level and then collect information at the tissue level, sort of integrate these three different length scales in, in our experimental setting. Um, we, have a, we have a similar device uh, designed now for, for tissue engineered arteries. This is a, um, and, and we've recently been focusing on, on human tissue engineered arteries. But here's, an, here's a, this is actually a tube in place of a, a vessel because there's no media in there. Um, but this device has an, has an ultrasound to, to quantify vessel wall thickness in real time. And so we can quantify thickness as the, as the vessel grows, remodels, adapts in culture. Um, it, two of these devices fit in a standard incubator and we have pumps and things to drive the flow rate. Again, there's a force transducer that can, we can perform intermittent biopsy biomechanical testing. This fits on a, our confocal microscope, again, downstairs. Uh, one of the challenges here is the vessel wall is a lot thicker than the mouse, so we can't get all the way through with our multi-photon. But nevertheless, we can use the, the, the confocal microscopy to, to quantify changes in, in the microstructure. Um, and these slides here are just to show, um, these are uh, endothelial cells from, from 
vessels exposed to flow versus vessels exposed to static, and we're seeing alignment and things that we expect to see. Um, vessels, endothelial cells aligning in the direction of flow um, where they're not so much in static. Okay, so, so one, of the, one of the things that I, that I hope to do when, in coming here before you guys is, is to talk about some of the things that we have have ahead and, and the, on the horizon and maybe um, spark some, some common interests and in, in things. So let me just talk a little bit about, about where we're going with these theoretical and, and experimental models. Um, the first sort of grouped into mechanically mediated remodeling associated with cardiovascular disease. We've been working with Bob Taylor and others um, on a, a mouse model for uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms and, and identifying, can we identify mechanical cues as a as a aorta transforms from a healthy aorta to a triple A. Um, a recent uh, project I'm working with Manu Platt on is is the role of HIV in cardiovascular disease. Um, HIV patients experience early onset of cardiovascular disease. What are the mechanisms behind that? It appears to be sort of vascular remodeling me mediated. Similarly, diabetes early onset of cardiovascular disease appears to be key vascular remodeling component to that, as well as atherosclerosis. Um, some of the other, other uh, sort of pursuits in our lab and tissue engineering, so we talked about this self-assembly approach, culturing cells on a, on a plate, peeling them up, rolling them into a tube, and, and we have this tube. One of the disadvantages of this process is it takes literally months and months to make a vessel. Can we use mechanical stimulus at, at early stages? So for example, cyclic strain, on cells on a sheet to, to improve uh, uh, extracellular matrix production and also improve the mechanical properties of the tissue sheets before we roll them into a tube. Um, can we use mechanical stimulation on foreign blood vessels to, to improve their mechanical properties and see how they remodel in response to mechanical loading? And also we're, we're working um, with, uh, again, this collaboration, we haven't talked about it much today by this collaboration with Yadong Wang on scaffold, uh, changing the, the, the properties of, of mechanical scaffolds for scaffold-derived engineered vessels. And what role does that have on, on remodeling of tissue-engineered blood vessels? Um, I, think I think maybe we'll stop, stop now. I'd like to, to acknowledge my collaborators and, and the folks in our, in our, in our lab. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Aaron. So you said that sometimes when you they, the vessels get to a certain pressure, they burst. Uh huh. And I was just wondering, like, do these, like, either you know, native tissues or tissue engineered vessels, do they have the same type of failure mode? And where is that? Is it in the center of the attachment points? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, hopefully, if our experimental, uh, are you talking about in vivo or in our device or? In your device. Or yeah. Yeah, hopefully in our device it's, it's in the center. We don't want sort of our, our suturing techniques to be the, the point of failure. So, so we'd like, like it to be in the center, but yes, they're, they're typically in the center. Depends on the vessel uh, in, in terms of the failure mode and how they fail. Have you guys ever tested like diseased vessels? I don't know, like if you have access to, you know, if there's like ones that have plaque. Yeah, human, human disease vessels. Yeah, we, we don't, but, but, we, but we could and we're interested in doing that. Um, you know, as you get things like plaques and things, um, the, the biomechanics becomes even more complicated because we have these local changes and we talked about the importance of the stress-free state, right? Now we have local changes in the stress-free state when we have a plaque here. And so, it's been a ton of work trying to quantify the stresses in, in a blood vessel with a plaque, but there's just so many assumptions involved in that. Bob. I had a couple questions about the remodeling you talked about. Mm -hmm. you, you predicted these tissue engineered vessels would thicken because the stresses are too high. Have they implanted any of these? Do they actually see that experimentally? And then my follow-up question is, is, and you may have mentioned this, is the remodeling targeting a particular stress level or is it a threshold? So in other words, if, you, if your stresses were too low, <coughs> would you predict that the vessels would thin? Yeah, so, so experimentally that's been, the, the, uh, your second question, experimentally, yeah, that's been shown. Actually, if, it, if the stress is too low, it atrophies. If it's, if it's too high, it grows. 
Um, your other question um, regarding implanting these vessels, that there have been um, a, a small number of animal trials. All this was derived in human, and so now they're trying to back up and derive it in animals to do the animal trials. Um, there, there is a, another group, a couple other groups working on this that, that actually have, have this approach in, in clinical trials, but not for coronary bypass, but for other, for other um, applications. But I don't, I don't have my hands on that data. Minor. So I thought it was interesting when you cut the long strips out of the sides of the coronary arteries and they kind of have a shear and swirl. Yeah. Do you see that in aortas? Have you seen that in any other arteries? And do you have a guess on what that means mechanically that a coronary artery would yeah. specifically need that? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we did not see it in carotids. So we did carot pig carotids and pig coronaries. Um, I think probably the mechanism, you know, the, the coronary arteries under such a more complex loading. They're, you know, as the heart's contracting, they're twisting, they're embedded in, um, you know, partly embedded in the, in the muscle of the heart, and so they're twisting, they're, they're actually bending in places, and, and so it's, more, it's a more complicated loading. And so that's what we're trying to figure out now. Where did this come from? Why is it, it, why is it there? Is it, is it there for a reason? What does it do to our predictions and stress and things like that? So, yeah. Is it always in the same? There's a left and a right coronary, right? Yeah. Are they in the opposite direction? I'm not sure. Roy, do you know? Roy's here. He did the work. <laughs> I just, I just um, talk about it. I just made a look at the LEDs, but that's something we want to look at. Is it like left and right, and then also like, you know, the side that's, you know, close to the myocardial. Yeah. 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 That's that's one of the that's that's one of the experiments sort of on the list. But but all of the all of the all of the things that we culture are under some axial strain, some some level of axial strain, some pressure, some flow, and so so yeah. So we have that we have all three of those parameters sort of controlled. But we haven't done the the combined sort of increased pressure, increased stretch, which is I think what you're what you're saying. Yeah, we haven't we haven't gotten there yet. There's a lot of a lot of experiments. Um, in cases of say like familial hypertension or something like that, are there any indications clinically or you know I don't know if people have done like SFPs or something like that that this mechano remodeling response is implicated in the disease itself. Yeah, um, you know that's that's kind of the that's that's kind of the big question, right? Where where does this stuff come from, and why do some people, why are some people so susceptible to it, to it and others not? Um, I don't know if I have a good answer. You know, looking at that, I mean, I, like actually growth and remodeling. In that, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that anybody is looking at that specifically from a from a from a remodeling point of view. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 in in sort of the resist resistant vessels, it's it's a little bit different beast because you have this huge contractile response and the myogenic myogenic response. Is is this what you're asking? Sort of the yeah. So so yeah, remodeling is a that's an active area study. Remodeling in the microvasculature. We I, I've done some work in in my postdoc actually culturing um, arterioles, isolating culturing arterioles from the rat crew master. You know, there's it's. You know, I, I think the, the mechanisms are similar, but there's some, some different rules to the game, right? You have this, so you increase pressure, the diameter actually decreases, right? And so, and so, so yes, it's, it's an active area of research. Um, it's a little bit different, different game. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, I mean, it just seemed to me like, the, like the, a lot of the mechanisms are similar. Yeah. Upside down. Backwards. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep, the, it, yeah, it's an active, active area of research of, of trying to understand these, and there's a couple additional, additional players in this. So things like this heavy myogenic tone, um, metabolites, and, and things like that. And, and so there's a couple other components that play a key role in that. Uh, it doesn't matter. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so you were showing the, the option of the vessel by doing five cycles at 10 and then 20, 30, and 40. Uh -huh. uh -huh. How would you choose uh, the kind of uh, protocol? Yeah, why not 10 cycles? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, to it's so dependent on the protocol of what happens to these things. And so what we were trying to figure out is, is the question we asked when we initially ran this protocol is, is at what pressures will these things burst? But, but really the ultimate pressure was, is there a, a load that we can run forever? You know, can we run 0 to 10 forever and will it burst or not? We've also run those, those experiments. Um, they do. <laughs> they do. Even at really low pressures, these, these freshly formed gels. Um, you know, the goal was to, to put them under mechanical loading and, and, and get them, even if it's low mechanical loading, stimulate them to, uh, to, to, grow, to grow and remodel, to, to be able to withstand more loading. Um, a, a different experiment, actually experiments from, from Bob Neerham's group, um, where they, they don't control the load, they actually control the strain, right? And so we can cyclically strain these things. Those will never fail because you're controlling the strain, you're not controlling the, the load. So it's a little bit different experiment, and so that's maybe the, the more useful experiment for gels. Nick. Yeah. Particularly with the longitudinal yeah. Strength, that correlate we we haven't looked into that a ton. Um, you know, you, you, with the mouse vessels, you know, talk about intima doesn't. You don't really even see the the a real intima in mouse vessels. In um, in pigs, we don't see a huge intima either. In the in the in the work by Holes Awful when he when he characterize the, the human coronaries, you see a huge intima. In fact, you can, you can separate, he's done other papers where he separates all three layers and does mechanical tests on all three layers. Um, we, we haven't, we, have, we, we don't uh, really look at that right now. That's definitely something we could. Does the pig vessels, the, the coronaries get I, <coughs> I don't think so, Roy. Do you, do you know? Do you, have you observed that? No, those pigs are pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. But even today, you know, I, I, I don't think they get a ton. Even, even I think Bob, Bob Taylor was trying to, to have a, find a model for animal, animal hyperplasia and atherosclerosis in a pig and had a hard time even introducing, getting a model to do that, right? Okay, there are no other questions. Good. Let's thank you again for your